Hi, I'm Peter Navarro, and I interviewed Seth Cropsey of the Hudson Institute for my book and film, Crouching Tiger. These are some key excerpts from a man who is one of the most astute strategic thinkers of our time. If you look at the current trajectory, we could be down to uh, fewer than 200 ships um, by uh, 2030. In the current budget cycle, uh, we could go from slightly over 100 deployable ships to 75 or so deployable ships um, within the next five or six years. So this is a real situation. Um, it's going to have real consequences for America as a great power, certainly for America as a maritime power. What are the Chinese building aircraft carriers for? Do they expect that they're going to equal 11 um, if we maintain that number? Um, it's possible, given the, um, given the long-range strategic thinking that is more characteristic of China than it is of the United States. However, the much more likely explanation is that uh, what they aim at uh, is projecting power in the area around the Western Pacific and near their, near their particular part of Asia, throughout Asia, from Northeast to Southeast Asia. Um, and we have uh, treaty alliances with five countries there. Uh, we have relationships with others that we constantly develop. And a, a, even a small Chinese aircraft carrier fleet uh, would increasingly raise doubts about whether um, the U.S. carrier fleet there, which now consists of one ship, uh, will be able to deter what China has, 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 uh, has launched. So I think that what's very much on their mind is the hegemony that generally Chinese foreign policy is aimed at, and specifically that hegemony established at sea, and an aircraft carrier is an extremely effective way of doing that. So long as there are powerful militaries, the militaries are constantly being transformed by technology, by tactics, by geographical necessity, um, by real-world events, by lessons learned from other people's conflicts. Um, and uh, there is much greater emphasis now than there was 15 years ago, for example, on unmanned aircraft, um, on unmanned submarines, uh, unmanned surface ships. Um, they can extend the range at which an aircraft carrier can launch uh, strikes at an enemy target because a drone could have, likely to have, greater range than the aircraft that we now have and the ones that are projected in the future. Um, by producing smaller underwater than submarines, smaller underwater um, vessels uh, at lower cost, uh, and the same thing is true on the surface, uh, one could extend the range and get a certain economies um, that we don't have right now. And that's the direction that we're going in. And I think that were this interview to be conducted 25 or 30 years from now, uh, and I'm happy to do it then, uh, <laughs> that we'll see that the planes flying off an aircraft carrier's decks uh, are going to be weighted much more toward drones than they are toward manned aircraft. That does not invalidate the aircraft carrier as a platform. It does have, effect, it does have consequences on the kinds of planes that are used to project the power that an aircraft carrier has. So if other countries in the world uh, see that the rest of Asia is looking more toward China, than toward the United States for security, uh, for alliance protection, uh, and as a great power, 
it will absolutely affect the American economy's ability to sell goods there and to be present as an economic power. So economics and security and alliance relationships, um, and in the end, our status as the dominant maritime power in the world cannot be separated from what happens in the future uh, between our naval force in the Western Pacific and the one that China is building. If the United States turns into a small, smaller state with a lesser navy, a reduced ability to project power, a decreased economic presence, the momentum will shift naturally toward China. The same thing has happened in history many, many times. Uh, the Dutch Republic was a great trading empire, but they didn't build much of a fleet, a naval fleet, to protect it. And when the English developed as a great naval power, they, you could say they ate the, the Dutch lunch. And that uh, diminished Holland as, a na it ended Holland as a naval power and diminished it as an economic power. So there is a connection between security and economics. And I agree with you that um, the taxpayer who says, why do we have to spend money to uh, preserve security relationships can be answered. We don't have to. I'm just saying there's a consequence. Those countries that have prospered uh, because of sea power and have forgotten or abandoned that sea power, uh, have suffered economically, uh, their security has been diminished, uh, their status as a great power has disappeared, um, and they never recovered it. Americans don't understand the history. Uh, they haven't looked at it. They don't realize the fact that our power, our status as a great power is inseparable from our status as a dominant naval power and the corollary that if that dominant naval power is surrendered, it is, there is no example in history of a country being able to recover it. Athens would be the first one. Um, Athens sat, sits at a, a critical point in the Mediterranean. It had a competition with its land-bound neighbor, Sparta, um, and the original strategy in the war between Athens and Sparta uh, was not to confront the Spartans who were more powerful on land, um, but to retreat within the city and to maintain the city's security and economy by trade, and that trade would be seaborne. Um, this was followed for a while, and then the Athenians forgot the good advice, and they started to try to engage Sparta on land. Uh, they let their sea power go, um, and they lost the war. They never recovered their sea power. Their existence as a great power ended. The immediate goal in China is hegemony is to be the overlord of Asia. The Chinese regime today is uh, fundamentally uh, an authoritarian regime. Um, there is the Communist Party that holds power and has no intention or desire of giving it up. Uh, there is no effective opposition to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and uh, they do pretty much what they please, uh, both domestically and, uh, and in foreign policy. What they please in foreign policy that affects us uh, is um, they are trying to become the hegemon of Asia. Um, the great power of Asia to the exclusion of anybody else, and that includes the United States, which is the only other serious competing power throughout the entire region. What is the uh, best course for the United States in preserving its presence in 
the Western Pacific. Uh, the first thing is that presence means presence. When President Obama and his administration spoke of the pivot to Asia, which was eventually changed to the rebalance to Asia, it made it seem as though we were going to take China as a possible strategic competitor more seriously. So that was a good thing. Um, but in order to uh, rebalance to Asia and to become more assertive requires both a diplomatic strategy or a diplomatic plan and a security plan. On the diplomatic side, the administration has done, I think, a reasonably good job. Uh, they've reached out to potential friends. They've reached out to friends and allies. Those are all good things. But uh, what the Obama administration has a less uh, clear hold on is that there is a connection between soft power, diplomacy, and hard power, which is the military. And on the military accounts, this administration has reduced the defense, defense spending by a half a trillion dollars since it came into office. And its plan is to reduce military spending by another half trillion dollars that will continue uh, even after it leaves office. That does not send a signal to those in Asia who look to us for security and friendship um, and support that doesn't send a signal to them that we're serious. It sends a signal that we're sort of wishy-washy. We take the diplomatic side seriously. We take the security side not so seriously. As long as there is human character and as long as the fundamental motives of self-interest and ambition and fear exist, there are going to be nations and led by people who see weakness as an invitation. That's no different today than it was when Thucydides described those three, ambition, uh, self-interest, uh, and fear as the primary motives of foreign policy, of national policy. If the U.S. falls away from the position of strength that it built up in the 20th century, especially after World War II, uh, it will invite more situations such as the ones we're seeing today. Uh, the possibility that Russian ambitions will extend uh, into the Baltics and other parts of the Soviet empire that Putin would very much like to uh, reestablish, um, and that Iran will be emboldened to continue in its nuclear weapons program. These are all countries that look at the United States and say, hmm, they're, they used to be there, but it seems as though they're going away, or they're war-weary, or they don't have the money anymore to spend on defense. Um, and that will cascade. That will produce more situations that threaten our allies and eventually will threaten us. Weakness invites aggression. It has historically. It's doing so today. I can guarantee you the same thing is going to happen in the future. What's the best way to manage alliances? Well, I'll tell you what the worst way is. The worst way is to say, we have alliances with you, and so you have to do the job. We're going to farm it out to you. We're going to outsource it. You take care of security in your region. That guarantees a mess and failure. The alternative to that uh, is to say, as the leader of this alliance, or as the greatest power in this alliance, we will take the lead, but we expect that you will do your part. And the fact is that um, many of our treaty allies in Asia are trying to do their part. A lot of the Asian nations that are threatened by Chinese territorial claims, fishing rights, sovereignty, and so on, are trying to build up amphibious capability. They're trying to build up their surface ship fleet um, so that they can defend their particular fishing interests or mineral interests or territorial interests. That's all a good thing. Uh, but uh, for the United States to expect that those countries, either solely or in the aggregate, 
can equal China, which has the second largest defense budget in the world, is unrealistic um, and inconsistent with the history of successful alliances. A naval fleet is a very complex thing, and it requires ports for ships, and it requires roads and rail lines to supply those ports. It requires ships, crews, maintenance, and not the least, it requires people who know how to build good ships. And that's called the industrial base, the defense industrial base. In this case, uh, the industrial base, base that supports the Navy. It's very simple. If you don't build enough ships, then the number of people who know how to build them will look for other jobs. Uh, and that's what's happened to the sea power industrial base of the United States steadily uh, since the end of the Reagan administration. Under the Reagan administration, the Navy was building uh, 12, 15, as many as 16 or 17 ships per year. Uh, today, we're lucky if we turn out six. And so that means that the number of people who work in shipyards uh, decreases, and the number of people who are master shipbuilders goes down uh, because there's no, no employment. Uh, and if you continue this out uh, for a decade or so, you end up with um, a situation where uh, if we ever decide, well, we want more ships, we're going to have to wait the five or ten years it takes to develop the expertise to build a good ship again. And that is, that, that is a major risk to the United States. On the other hand, uh, China is turning out lots of ships, many ships per year. Uh, it's building several classes of attack submarine. Uh, it's building patrol boats for closer to shore duties, it's building destroyers, frigates, um, ballistic missile submarines, uh, aircraft carriers, and uh, in addition to that, it maintains the largest merchant marine fleet in the world. Um, and that also requires builders. The skills are not between building naval ships and merchant ships are not always the same because of the combat systems in the, in the latter. But uh, they have a flourishing defense industrial base. They have a flourishing shipyard uh, industrial capacity, uh, and they're using it. And they, we don't. Uh, we have very good people. Um, they produce very good products, but the, but the size of the community that does that is decreasing. If we do not have the people who know how to build good ships, and it takes us 10 or 15 years to produce them, that means that if a large and dangerous event occurs that requires sea power response, we're basically screwed until that industrial base can be brought up to speed again. And 10 or 15 years in those terms is a long time. How would a war with China start? I think the most reasonable idea um, is that it would not start because the United States or China decided we want to go to war with you. I think right now uh, the most likely cause of war would be a miscalculation. China decides, for example, that um, it can take the Senkakus and Japan is too weak and the United States is too weak or else the United States is, will not honor its treaty obligations with Japan, um, or the United States will find itself too occupied with other things in order to support the Japanese. And so the Chinese decide, okay, now we're going to do it. And it turns out they're wrong. Um, that Japan defends itself vigorously, calls on the United States, on its treaty, the United States to honor its treaty obligations. The United States honors its treaty obligations in the expectation that it can contain the conflict over the Senkakus in, and resolve it in favor of Japan 
but the calculation is wrong and, it, and the war widens. That is much more likely than a conscious decision in Beijing. Today is the day we're going to attack the United States, sort of the way Tokyo did in December of 1941. So I think a miscalculation, um, uh, it doesn't take a lot. Thank you.